Welcome to Oddball. I'm Amino Hassan in Phoenix, Arizona, and that over there is Charlotte Wilder in New York City. New York City, baby. The city, the, the windy city, as they call it. They don't call it that. Well, some people <laughs> might. <laughs> um, how you doing? I mean, did you have a fun weekend? March Madness? I don't know. A lot of basketballs flying around. Uh, I watched a lot of NBA basketball. If you ask me if I have March Madness, I do not. I have March Sanity. Oh, cool. I'm yeah. always mad, so I wouldn't know what that feels like. Um, today, I mean, I'm very excited. We're going to play a new game called Odd One Out. Now, okay. our producers have selected six of the biggest stories in basketball, uh, and they're in a random order, but we can only talk about five. So the first one we can talk about for five minutes, the second one for four minutes, the third one for three minutes, and in descending order, I'm bad at math. This is what they've told me. Um, <laughs> at the end, we're going to see the odd one out that didn't make the cut that we don't get to talk about. Are you with me? I'm with you. We don't. So we don't know the topics. They're not going to tell us the topics. We don't get to pick the topics. They're just throwing them at us. Yeah, throwing them at us, and we have to spend the allotted amount of time on each one. Okay. Are you ready? All right. I'm ready. Okay, with five minutes, let's see what's behind door number one. Oh, it's Big Vic. Is this <laughs> is this our contractually obligated Victor Wembanyama uh, segment? Hold on, let me. Yeah, right here, Article Seven, Section Five, Section. Uh, no, that's not a five. That's V, Roman oh. V. Yes. Classic. Let's talk about Wembanyama. Yeah, sometimes it it changes. The clause changes every time. Um, on Saturday night, Big Vic became the first rookie since Shaq to put up 40 and 20. Against the New York Knicks, Jalen Brunson scored a career-high 61 points in that game, by the way. Um, and Wemby even did something like very not Wemby-like and threw the ball into the crowd after the game because despite Brunson's 61 points, the Knicks did not win and Victor Wembanyama got fined $25,000, I mean. Kitten has claws. Look at that. Look who's showing some fangs now. Right. I mean, were you surprised when when you saw him do that? Yeah, I, like I, I didn't know he had that in him. He seems like such a nice guy. I, I would have had him walking into the Knicks locker room afterward with the ball, with an apology and a handwritten note for Jalen Brunson. But no, I like this. I like this newer, tougher Wembenyama who's not taking shit from anybody. Maybe he's just been listening to Cowboy Carter all weekend and he was like, you know what? I'm in San Antonio. Like it's it's time to be tougher. Um, so famously, after Steph Curry entered the league, I mean, mm -hmm. um, there is a clear divide. And we've got a really great little graphic here. And if you're listening and you can't see it, first of all, you should be watching so that you can see it. But basically, mm -hmm. there are a lot more threes now, do you think that one day we're going to be like, whoa, this is how Wembenyama changed the game, and here's a little graphic with little Lego pieces that show that? No, uh, because how do you change the game when step one is be seven foot five and look mm. like move like a guard, right? The whole thing about Steph Curry, and by the way, I think it's a little presumptuous to give him all the credit. I work for an organization called the Phoenix Suns, and that's how we played. And that we like to think that we're the ones that influenced basketball to go to threes and layups with an emphasis on that but i digress for steph curry of average size for an nba guard or for guards even at the collegiate basketball level it's easy to try to emulate i'm not saying you can reach his level of proficiency but to say i want to play like steph curry it just involves being very proficient at shooting from long distance and then using the threat of that shot to be able to drive and and get to the layup for Wembenyama, the first step of how to play like him is to be freakishly sized. And so you can't play like Wembenyama any more than you can play like Shaquille O'Neal or, or play like Magic Johnson or any other kind of these guys that were just freaks of nature physically for their for the game of basketball. But what about, did you read that GQ article like last year or something about guys who got leg lengthening surgery? I see it on TikTok all the time. And I'm really? I've I saw a dude who was 5'11 get the surgery to be 6'4. Now he's walking around with like the double cane thing. I'm just like, is 5'11 that bad? No. First of all, 5'11, you just say you're six feet. Second of all, the proportions look so off. It's like they're on stilts, but only like half of their legs are stilts. I don't know. Anyway, um, Wembenyama also became the first rookie to have a stat line of 40, 20, and seven. 
since John Drew in 1974. Do you remember John Drew? I mean, for the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah, I'm gonna guess. Yeah, there you go. Wow, you're like a yeah. walking encyclopedia. Um, okay, so the the only thing that I can think of in terms of being seven foot, like we've got DJ Burns of NC State, and he's six seven and he's huge. Do you think that that is like what does Wemby do against a guy who's twice his width? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think we got to go all the way to NC State. I think in division down in New Orleans, there's got a guy who's six seven mm. in both directions, right? So, I, I you know, and that's the thing that I wor worried or wondered about before the start of his career, but he seemed to navigate it well so far. I think ultimately we're going to start seeing teams over this next offseason try to find what is the Wemby stopper? How do you bother him? And I, I would have to guess someone big and heavy might be the antidote. Or maybe you just tickle him. I, I think that's a foul. Has no, anyone tried fouls. that? I'm serious. Has anyone tried that? Tickling? I think yeah. I, you that that's a technical. Can they? But what the refs flagrant. like can't see if they're being tickled. Uh, I think the reaction would 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 say it all. You go ah, and then they go to the review, and then they <laughs> see. You know, I don't know. You got. <laughs> You have Mitchell Robinson going up to him and go, Gucci, 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 Gucci. Like, yeah, right and then he him. starts laughing and they're like, oh, okay, we're out of time for this one. All right, door number two. I was wondering how long you were going to go. We have a timer now. The Petty Olympics. Oh, okay. I know what they're talking about here. I mean, uh -huh. they're we, this is what we're dealing with. So on Friday, Luka Doncic um, was, they were, the Mavs were playing the Kings and Vladi Divac ah. was sitting courtside. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who might not remember, Vladi was the one who did not draft Luca in 2018. Instead, he took Marvin Bagley the third. What? I'm, yeah, about to say, I'm surely he he drafted some other generational talent. You know, there's just so much so much to choose from. Where is Marvin Bagley the third? Detroit. <laughs> really? Where he belongs? Yes. Oh, that feels like a little too on the nose. Okay, so well, Luca has not forgotten this, even though he's doing a lot better than poor Marvin. Um, and at the end of the game, he waved goodbye to Vladi and then walked past um, fans to the Mavs bench. And you could see him saying, he should have drafted me. Mm. So, yeah. okay. So yes, that okay. is going that is going up against Oklahoma City fans who booed mm. Kevin Durant eight years after he left them. Um that's who wins this, in your opinion? Who is well, I mean, I, I, I want to say, you know, for the OKC fans, you know, I know you think you have a personal relationship with Kevin Durant. You don't. Luka Doncic has a personal reason for the man who did not draft him to be sitting there to to have that that kind of beef and that pettiness. But Charlotte, I'm going off the board. Pettier than Luka, pettier than <gasps> OKC fans is Minnesota Timberwolves owner Glenn Taylor. Because part of the details coming out from the reporting from The Athletic is that A-Rod and Mark Laurie wanted a special suite where they could convene and talk about things uh, during games down the hall from the locker room. Glenn Taylor was like, well, I've always gone to like the media room and dined with the employees and everything. And, and he thought that it was like gaudy, gaudy and outlandish to have their own secret bunker suite in the arena. Now that the, the sale has got fallen through oh, no, but of let course Mark Lurie and A-Rod are still minority owners Glenn Taylor has taken to using that suite but preventing them from using it because quote this is for the majority owner only that ladies and gentlemen mwah, that's petty that's a gold how, medal how are they going to own a team together because they're still minority owners I mean how like that is going to be the most uncomfortable um, I would say cafeteria, but we all know that a billionaire doesn't even know what that word means. Well, this one does, because that's where he was eating with the employees. And he's a salt of the earth guy until it's like, OK, this special suite, it's mine now. Get out. Yeah. Oh, this special seat's actually kind of fun. Also, um, I'm being told that Marvin Bagley actually plays for the Wizards now. I mean, look at that. Look at that. Right where he belongs. Look at that. He went from Sacramento Detroit to Washington. I'd love to see a graphic, if we could, of the combined win percentage that Marvin Bagley has experienced in the league. Because I think this man is losing at a historic rate. I feel <laughs> so I feel so bad though that whenever we talk, like when we talk about look how great Luca is, and then like Marvin just catches these strays. Like he didn't make the decision. 
Well, you know who else should catch strays? DeAndre Ayton and, and Trey Young as well. Yeah. Like they, I was they, there. They, I was at that, that draft. Fun fact. Nice. <laughs> I just saw I saw Trey Young's fit. I it was all, you know, it was very confusing because also the draft stuff like that to me feels Aren't like we math. supposed to go faster as this thing goes along. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, but look, we still have 22 seconds left. We have our little graphic there. I can tell you about how they had to switch the hats and everything in the 2018 draft. I don't know. Luca and the Rockets ended the uh Luca and the Mavs ended the Rockets 11 game win streak on Sunday also. So there's that. Are they the most dangerous team in the West? Just kidding. We don't have time. <laughs> Dang. Uh, all right. Door number three. They're not really doors. They're more of like bingo. Screen. Panels. They're panels. It's like uh, Vanna White flipping the letters over. We'll get Embiid's return. Okay. This one should be fun. Wait, this is only three minutes? Yeah, this is only three minutes. Did you want more? I mean, uh, clearly we don't have a choice. The producers okay. have decided. Okay, well, our producers are asking us if it is too risky to rush Embiid back because he was seen practicing. There, did you see him practicing with contact? Yes, me? yes, he's been going five on five. Apparently, what did you think? How did you think he looked? Well, it's funny that we should be doing a rushing Embiid back segment rushed because it's it's only fitting, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, this I, I talked to Keith Pompey who covers the Sixers for the Philadelphia Inquirer this weekend, and he told me that. His suspicion is that Embiid is really trying to come back because he wants to play in the Summer Olympics, but he knows if he comes back for the Olympics, but not for the Sixers playoff run, he's mm -hmm. going to get a lot of flack from the local Philadelphia media and the local Philadelphia fans. So he is coming back to kind of say, I was here, I tried, I put forth my best effort so that no one kind of questions him when he comes back for the Olympics. It's been about two months since he had meniscus surgery, and mm -hmm. that's what they said. He would be ready around two months to start contact. So technically it's on time, but I, I just I don't know if this is the best option for him long term. Do you think, I mean, does it seem like that is rushing it? Like if there weren't the Olympics this year, do you think that he would be trying to come back? No, I think he'd be out. I think really? he just he would have just caught called it a season also by the way apparently he's had a meniscus tear in that same knee before so it, it's it? not just it, it, well i think it was a repair last time this time i think it was a removal hence why he's he's ready to play well you know i do think that the sixers are gonna have a worse seed but be better with Embiid if he is healthy which could be a nightmare for another team so maybe this sort of well, I won't say it works out in their favor because nobody wanted him beat hurt, but it could get it could get a little funky. <laughs> a blessing in disguise. Yes, we'll I, fall seven seeds down and then we'll beat them with the element of surprise. I am just always looking for that silver lining. I mean, yes, you are. What's next? You know, what's next? Well, we still have 41 seconds. You want to keep talking about him beat? You said that we rushed it. Okay. And now we have extra time. I'm going to take this time and we're going to stack it onto the next one and our producers aren't going to be able to do anything about it. What's the fourth story? Let's see. Upset alert. What is this about? Hmm. Oh, this is about the Western Conference, I mean. This is about Oklahoma City, Denver, and Minnesota being separated by just one game and the Warriors sitting very uncomfortably in 10th and i think the question that our producers would like us to answer is say golden state makes it as the eighth seed from the play-in tournament which of these teams the thunder nuggets timberwolves do you think would be most scared to face them most scared is an interesting way to frame a question <laughs> because it's like is, are any of them scared probably not golden state has not been good this year uh they've struggled they're not this is not the same boogeyman that has tortured all of these franchises at one point or another having said that i think of those three teams minnesota is the most vulnerable i know okay. i said that oklahoma city i've been singing about how oklahoma city has zero experience and it's hard for the zero experience team to flourish in the playoffs but that is assuming at least a close amount of talent levels the, it's not close. Oklahoma City is a lot more talented. They're a lot deeper. They're just way better. Denver, obviously, exclude them from this conversation. I don't know if there's a team in the league that can beat them in a seven-game series. So that leaves me with Minnesota, that even though they have Anthony Edwards and they've got a little bit of 
a playoff rind to them. I also think that they are a team that is susceptible to to dumb basketball during stretches. And you know why they I, should also be scared of me? Why is that? Because uh, Draymond Green choked out Rudy Gobert oh, once upon a yeah. time. Yep, duly not Let me write that one down. Yeah, you might have forgotten. People forget. Yep. Actually, no one ever talks Draymond. about it. No one's like, "Whatever happened choked after Draymond?" Rudy Gobert got it. Yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, door number five. This is our last story because we're not allowed to talk about the sixth one. What is it? What is it? The broken clock. Did you see this? <laughs> I did not see this. What what broken clock? On uh, the Magic and the Kings played a 48 minute and 50 second game on Saturday. I mean. Yo, what's going on with basketball? They're like, well, back in my day, they didn't get things wrong like clocks and three-point lines, which, by the way, that one was insane because they played five games on that court with the three-point lines all messed up. Nobody noticed? Nobody. As soon as I looked at the screen before they told me there was a three-point line discrepancy, I was like, what's wrong with that line over there? Why yeah, is that one so close to the top of the key? Do you think it's because everybody's just a sheep now and they're afraid to say what they see? All these kids are stuck in their phones. No one oh. noticed. Like, oh my God, what did my interest, Pinterest say? Oh, oh I Pinterest? got a new follow. Oh, my tick, what's the new TikTok? That, oh, have we started playing the game? Okay. Never looking at the court one time. Kids, children, coaches. Or, yeah, coaches. There were adults there, just saying. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway, the clock was stuck at 8.15 in the third quarter with multiple possessions. And I'm now stuck with no time because our clocks ran out. So we're a part of the problem. I mean, let's see what the sixth story we can't talk about is. Okay. No. Oh. Ah. I wanted to talk about this one because Alex Caruso hit seven threes against the Timberwolves, and he said that it's because the DJ was playing bangers, and according to reporters, the bangers were uh, a sandstorm. I don't know that song. What is sandstorm? How's it go? It, well, now I now I can't remember, but it's like oh, isn't that it? Is that sandstorm? That's his. <laughs> was Alex Caruso even alive when that song came out? Like, probably not, but are you surprised? That's like the least surprising thing I've ever heard that, that Alex Crusoe was like, Sandstorm got me going. Like, he's been going to some, like, weird club in L.A. And just, it reminds him of him when he's on There's that. That, no club in, I've been to the mall. There's no club in L.A. that's playing Sandstorm. Not in 2024. I don't maybe know. Maybe 1998. I, I feel like he misses the Lakers and he's like, Sandstorm. Reminds me of my days at Coachella. Yeah. In 19, or not Coachella, what's the other one called? Burning Man. It was either that or the final countdown. All right, I mean, I'm really excited about this one. It is time for Lie Detector, where we hear from people around the NBA, uh, and we decide whether they're lying or not. And you're pretty good at this. You're like a human lie detector when it comes to, to basketball. Uh, are you ready for this first one? Um, hold on. Let me let me get my apparatus ready. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Lights on. Let's go. A light? Don't you yeah, need like so the, cable? Well, okay. well, white means you're telling the truth, and then if the color changes, it tells me what like how bad the lie is. So. Wow. Sick. Yeah. Okay. Uh so LeBron James on the Mind the Game podcast that he and JJ Reddick have together. Um, he's you know what? Just let's just roll the clip. This is what he said play a lot of chess not in real life I, i've actually you know a lot of people have told me you should look you should play chess because you'll be great i've never played chess but in, my, play, in, yeah, in my mind yeah, in theory yeah, yeah. i feel like i play chess on the floor yeah okay this makes me like the, the jj the jj's little interjection in the middle there just really kills me it, here's here's my question here's a lie for you i mean do people mm -hmm. actually tell lebron that he should play real chess uh yeah, according to a little lie detector, that that is oh it doesn't show up. Never mind. <laughs> Good try. That's a lie. I like he says a lot of people tell me I should. Play. I just don't think. I don't know, Charlotte. Like I just don't imagine people coming up to him being like, "You play chess? You should, bro. You should play chess." I I, I do like that he he quickly leapt in before because he saw JJ about to talk. Like I I don't play chess. I don't play chess, but if I did, I'd be the very best chess player who ever lived. Even the grandmasters, Gary Kasparov, could not hold a candle to me. 
in if you <laughs> yeah good let me stop he's a, i'm not as good at my trump as i am at obama so yeah i think that's fine i also think that lebron is you can see the wheels turning you can see him be like i play a lot of chess and he's like oh god now i'm gonna be asked about playing chess all the time if i keep up this lie so no it's chess on the court um i, I do think though I don't think people ask him if he plays chess. I think maybe he could be good at chess. You, I, I mean, I'm not here to say that he can or can't be <laughs> good at chess. I'm saying I don't think people tell him all the time, <laughs> yo, you should play chess. That's just a weird thing. Oh, that's a, who said, who talks like that? Yeah, who walks up and inquires, hey, Charlotte, you should play charades. You're really good at it. No, I get Candyland a lot. They're like, you oh. seem you seem like you spend some time on Rainbow Road. And I'm like, yeah, and I can't play Mario Kart. So, OK, we're going to move on. I mean, we have Steph Curry, another uh, guy you might have heard of. Mm -hmm. This one's um, more sad, maybe, than the LeBron one. But Steph Curry said that fighting for a play in spot is, quote, unfamiliar territory, but we're loving the challenge right now. Is Steph Curry telling the truth or is he lying? He's telling the truth about it being unfamiliar territory. Even though they've been in the play-in before, we're just going to conveniently forget about that. But that last time, they were com they were comfortably in the play-in. This time, they're fighting for their play-in lives, and that one is brand new to him for sure. Loving the challenge? Loving the I just saw you cry the other day. Because your teammate got ejected four minutes in. No, sir, you're not loving the challenge. I don't think you'd have that reaction if you were the three seed. I think you'd be frustrated with Draymond. Like, come on, dude, we talked about this. But I don't think you'd be crying. You're crying not just because Draymond is doing this thing that we talked about a million times over, but because you are on the cusp of watching the play-in at home, which is another level of, of absolute degradation. I would go so far as to say that Steph Curry is actually hating the challenge. I don't think he wanted this challenge at all. You know how players are always like, the challenge fuels me? I think Steph Curry is like, this challenge makes me go home, get into bed, put the covers over my head, and say, Aisha, hold my calls, because this is this is really depressing. <laughs> you, um, got you got Aisha as a secretary, too, like on the side? <laughs> no, just I have her like holding his phone. Oh. Like hold my calls. He's like, I yeah. don't want this. With it's me. Mr. Kerr. It's <laughs> like tell him, tell him. Like I'm I don't want to talk to Steve. <laughs> Go away, Steve. All right. Well, sorry to Steph. Um. Oh, this is a fun one we have here. Mm -hmm. The the third lie we've got to detect. Larry David. You love Larry David. I mean, I love your enthusiasm. David. Just had an episode about how rude it is to drape your jacket over the back of your seat when someone's behind you, and yet Larry was stretched out like this at the Elite Eight. Look at that foot over that rail. He is taking right. up someone else's space. What do you think? Is he, is he, I mean, not he, it's nothing he said, but are his actions well, making him a liar? To clarify, the back of your own chair is your, your space. The guy behind Larry felt like, no, that's my space because it's rubbing up against my legs. So in this case, Larry's got his feet over, not quite a seat in front of him. That's just a, like the little hockey boards or whatever. So I'm looking at it right now. I'm going to say you're good, Larry. You're good. That's, that's, that's no one's real estate. So that might as well be yours because yeah. it's not the back of anyone's seat. No, I think I think he's got a lot of space between his uh, air monarchs. Is that what those are? And yeah. the the guy, the guy right in front of him. Um, we don't have a lot of space, though. I mean, this is the this is the end of our show. I would say thank you for watching to the fans at home. But you say you say don't do that. Don't thank them every single time for every segment. You can thank them at the end of the show. This is the end of the show, so you can thank them there. But I don't like it when, like, at the end of a segment, you thank them for watching that particular segment. But do you want to thank them now? Because it's the end of the it's show. It's very annoying. I <laughs> never th thanked anyone in my entire life. Oh, uh, before we let everybody go, and it kills me to say this, but you actually had a good April Fool's joke. Here it is. Maybe call a meme? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... Are you kidding? Wait, what the f***? I mean, what the f***? I am mad at you. I was like, we should call him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's how you do April Fool's, ladies and gentlemen.